40 years and I've learned nothing. Nothing useful about the people, factories, politics and personalities of Hackney. The name has declined to a brand identity, a chart topper. Worst services, best crime, dump of dumps. I've walked over much of it on a daily basis, taken thousands of photographs, kept an 8mm film diary for seven years, and what does it amount to? Strategies for avoiding engagement, elective amnesia, dream paths that keep me submerged in the dream. My arrival in Hackney was totally fortuitous and accidental. It was simply that friends I'd known from Dublin had got a house here and wanted to share it and to have a kind of communal house. In this part of London, it was still exactly like an immediate post-war city. We were really on a big point of changeover, that a lot of the people, the old working class families who lived in this block, were, were keen to move out. They wanted to get out to Loughton and Ongar and Epping Forest. They wanted to sort of escape the coming multiculturalism of the inner city. When I worked as a labourer, packing cigars in Clerkenwell, I cycled. The bike cost six quid in Kingsland Waste Market. I wobbled around the notorious Old Street roundabout without damage. I cycled down Homerton High Street, past the Lesney Matchbox Toys Factory and onto the marshes, when I had the task of painting white lines for the football pitches. The sharp saddled bicycle was a collaborator in any reading of the city. Territory crossed and crisscrossed, burial grounds and back rivers explored. Now you've got within 360 degrees the entire history of London planning. Everywhere around there are revised housing. I've, I've got footage of going up to the top of these tower blocks in the late 60s and the tower blocks were just not well enough built and they just became an environment for cockroaches. Later in the day, I've got footage of them. I sat on our roof and I recorded them being blown up. Great clouds of dust, pigeons swirling about. And now again, in, in the kind of pre-Olympic development era, orange shutters are being clapped over all of the later period developments and they're going in their own turn to finish up with what looks like a piece of marine architecture, except that it's over this traffic ditch of Queensbridge Road. And behind us too, in the sort of surrealism of Hackney life, you have an old, old Hackney pub, now made into a gastro pub, and dressed with bizarre Egyptian elements and crow's nests inside, gilded Egyptian. That's the nature of Hackney. One collision on top of another collision. Social planners have blocked the rat runs and sealed doors and put barriers across roads cutting out, so they believe, the escape routes of street dealers and balcony gangs. Crack houses have been spectacularly raided, with camera crews in attendance, and the result? Urban drift, melancholy, bordering on catatonia. Well, I thought we'd come up here to the German hospital just off Graham Road. It has become a series of uh, private flats now that, that had once been this part, a lunatic asylum. But right behind us, is the piece where Joseph Conrad came when he returned from Africa and he started to put together Heart of Darkness. At that very time in Graham Road, there was a woman starving to death who'd lost her job. And in a sense, the Heart of Darkness was here all along. It's another change is when, when we originally lived in Hackney, um, we, we would come up to Ridley Road Market every single day. The whole thing was that you decided what you were going to eat on the day and you just bought whatever was cheap, a good bargain up here and then go back and cook it. You were engaging with the landscape, you were walking through Hackney, you kind of bumped into different people and um, you saw the entire kind of spectrum of human life, like the news of the world, just in passing through this market. So the atmosphere and the culture when we first moved here was old Jewish. The Ridley Road Market had delicatessen shops and that was the most exotic sort of food we could buy at that time. It was where a lot of the battles to do with Oswald and Mosley and fascism were fought and Mosley used to speak in this market. The area was built on was this sense of permission to, to deal and everything. I think that's threatened now because the council want to something that's much more controllable, you know, a, 
a different kind of market that nobody quite knows what's going to happen next. Has you got a stand? That's a better one. I'm coming west off the avenue under a canopy of London plane trees, old enough to appear in sepia postcards, coming home at the end of an afternoon walk, councils of sleek crows, magpies imitating road drills. It's a habit I can't break, the habit of hackney. Well, we're standing in a yard that's tucked away alongside Ridley Road Market, but it's very typical of the landscape that's now grown up in Hackney Wick on the edge of the blue fence with the Olympic development. And what happens is that out of the shadows creep people who take these surviving walls and turn them into their galleries, into kind of independent galleries in which the most extraordinary and baroque forms of art start to appear. Who does them, we don't know. Um, they just appear overnight as, as a kind of window dressing of the city. And this is the kind of combination of fiction and documentation that I've tried to tap into in writing this book. This peace mural is from 1985, at the period when Tony Blair was still in Hackney. And now, ironically, it's interposed al alongside this enormous Barrett's housing development, which is on the, the transport hub where the new station is growing up. And the two things together just don't speak the same language. They're not in the same world. And I think if you go back to a vision of what Hackney was, this is it. And if you want to see what Hackney is in danger of becoming, that's it. And there's no conversation between the two things. Well, initially, I was simply going to call the book Hackney a fiction, because I think Hackney is a, is a place of self-generating mythologies. Everybody has his, his own version of what the story is. The layering of this place is, is so amazing and exciting. Um, you, you really can't stand around for very long before someone steps out of a building and, and wants to give you another part of the narrative. And so the story gradually accumulates. My method for writing really is just simply to, to wander about, put yourself in the right place and uh, wait for somebody to contact you and give you the next chapter.